Welcome back to the Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. In this format, which is realized in collaboration with the Federal Ministry of Education and Research and Springer Nature, we offer the unique opportunity of an intimate setting so you can engage with global leaders in research as well as entrepreneurs and innovators. My name is Aline Löken. I'm a senior editor at Nature Communications, the flagship open access journal of the Nature Portfolio. Now it's my absolute honor to welcome Lilia moritz schwarz uh, to these breakthrough conversations. Um, she is a professor in anthropology and history at the University of Sao Paulo and a visiting professor at Princeton University. She has been studying the history of Brazil and specifically focusing on the role of race, gender and inequality and in exploring national identities. Before we delve into the research that you do now, can you tell us what got you interested in studying Brazilian history and in particular uh, writing about Brazilian history, specifically Afro-Brazilian and indigenous history of Brazil? Thank you very much for your question. I'm Brazilian, so I spent all my life in Brazil. Brazil is a very unequal country. It's the sixth more unequal country in the world. And inequality started to be a kind of language in Brazil. And it's especially against black people and indigenous people and women. So I decided to study the intersectional uh, social markers of difference. So I think it's very important for us because in Brazil, the black population, it's not a minority. Uh, black population corresponds to 56.4% of the whole population. But even so, it's a major minority in representation. And on the other side, I am white. And whitening is a very perverse process, social process, in my country. So I decided to study whitening in Brazil and how difficult this social process could be to democracy, can be to democracy. Would you say that you were already aware of these inequalities growing up as a child, as an adolescent in Brazil? Yeah, yeah, because I'm, I have the privilege to be white, to be part of a mid, mid for a wealthy family, so I could study in private schools. But then my father, and my mother, they wanted me to enter in a public school. And then I had this beautiful experience of being part of my country. And then I entered in this big public university. And I have other friends, colleagues coming from different parts of society. So I could understand social privilege and I could understand how it's important that we, white, could speak about not just about ourselves, but about others, and about the impact, impact we have on others' lives. So would you say that was eye-opening, that first day in school when you looked around? Certainly, certainly, because in Brazil, the best schools are private. So if you stay in a private school, you can achieve a kind of cultural myopia. <laughs> no, you cannot see. You cannot really see because you are surrounded by people like you are. Mm -hmm. Then it was education, public education. It's really the big challenge and the destiny of my country. Mm -hmm. We really need public education, good quality public education. Could you speak a bit more about the breakthrough that you presented here at Falling Walls? Yeah. They invited me to talk about democracies and how, democ how we are experiencing a very dangerous moment in our common agenda. How democracies could be transformed in autocracies. So I could speak about vari various countries, United States, Hungary, Turkey, Philippines, but I decided to speak about Brazil because it's my country, it's where I live, where I teach. <laughs> and then using the case of Brazil 
in the sense to think about how to protect democracy. democracy. As you just mentioned, your research focuses on Brazil, but the same trends can really be seen in many different nations across the world. So does this, um, I guess, this trend of really extreme right parties gaining popularity, gaining votes, so would you say that implies that right sentiment has been suppressed in the past, but it was always present, and now we're experiencing this moment where it's sort of rising to the surface? Yeah. I wrote a book called About Authoritarianism in Brazil that was published in the beginning of 2019 when President Jair Bolsonaro, that is a retrograde president, was elected. And... The book has two theses. The first one, our present is full of past. <laughs> we cannot talk about present without thinking about legacies, about histories. And second, to those who reacted with a big surprise when this kind of candidate was elected, the answer of the book was, we were always authoritarian. So. That was the kind of thing that was like a kind of social eraser, <laughs> but it's back. And it's unbelievable because we live, I, li I li live in a moment that I thought that democracy was our ultimate goal, but it's not like this for lots of people. So that's why it's so important to talk about democracy, it to defend democracy, it to regain democracy. <laughs> To that first uh, point that you just mentioned about the present being fundamentally influenced by the past, you've shown that specifically in Brazil, the slave system, and obviously slavery was abolished more than 100 years ago, still has very profound effects on the politics of today. Um, so could you elaborate a bit more on how this structural oppression persists today? Thank you, Aline. Yeah, Brazil is a very paradoxical case because Brazil was the last country to abolish the slave system. Brazil was also the country that kidnapped most people from Africa. And Brazil, from, different from the United States, had enslaved all over the country. So that created a naturalized a kind of language, a language of inequality. And that's not past because in the present, we have a kind of pattern that we called uh, structural racism. The idea that we have, I know that there is not such a thing like biological race, but there is social race. So social race is based in color, and social race can produce patterns of discrimination. So in my country, that people love to say that Brazil is a racial paradise, <laughs> it's the contrary. We have discrimination in education, in health, public transportation, rates of death and birth. So this is, that's why we call nowadays structural racism, because race structures our daily life in Brazil. Mm. So these groups that you just mentioned have historically been marginalized. They have not been in positions of power. They have not been able to really participate in, in politics, for example. Um, but what I found counterintuitive about Brazil um, is that the voting behavior of these uh, groups is not what one might expect. Could you comment on this. You mean in this this elections of October 13? 30? Yep. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, first of all, it's important to say that since we had sla the slave system in the country, we had reaction. So, and slaves created in pub uh, collective insurrections. They escaped. They created quilombos that, are, that were runaway at camps. They killed people, so they were ne never passive, as an official history uses to, to try to describe them like this. And nowadays, the black movement in Brazil is very important. So we just passed through elections now, 
now October 30, 2022, and Brazil has a new president, uh, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, Lula, a former metal work uh, trade unionist, the seventh son of a very poor family, <laughs> is elected. It's the third time he's elected as a president. And he was elected because of the northeast of the country, because of the black people and poor people. So I think that tells a lot about another country inside the country. <laughs> no? At the same time, it was a close election, right? Uh, it came to a standoff between him and Bolsonaro. So there are still, yeah. uh, um, even from these groups, a lot of Bolsonaro voters. So how do you explain that? I think that's the question I was trying to ask before. Yes, very good question. One thing is, uh, the Bolsonarismo, as we called Bolsonaro's followers, are really alive. But that corresponds to 30%, 27% of the country. And mostly, well, most of them are in the southeast and south of the country. The country is really divided, and that's not very good. But that was the results. The results were really tight. But one can have to think that Bolsonaro was the first president that was not re-elected. And so you have to think that he used the machine of the state to get vote, votes. So one can say that the person that votes for Lula are spontaneous voters. And the person that votes for Bolsonaro, some of them are spontaneous and some are not. Mm -hmm. So the difference would be much, much higher <laughs> if Bolsonaro hadn't used the state no? in order to achieve votes. <laughs> How much um, do you think his success can be attributed to him being a very charismatic leader? Good question. In my opinion, the Brazilian elections were so interesting all over the world because it was the first time, at least for us, that we had two previous or previous presidents in campaign and two charis very charismatic presidents. So Bolsonaro is very charismatic. Otherwise, he would not stay in power for four years having this, this it was a, our campaign to com to, to against COVID-19 was really a disaster. Uh, we had almost more than 600 victims, and mainly because of a very negationist campaign. Mm. So it's, it's hard to explain how Bolsonaro is still there. <laughs> and in my opinion, it's because he's really charismatic. Also, he made this alliance with evangelical churches and also with the militaries. So this is the, if we can say that autocracies look the same, this is the original face of autocracy in Brazil. Now putting together a digital populace and a person with strong connections with militaries, with dictatorship, and with evangelical fundamentalist churches. You just touched upon it, and I wanted to follow up on the role of the church religion in this election, if you could delve a little bit deeper into that. That's, again, a good quest question, Aline, because Brazil is not a, a religious country. It's not. It's, not, it's not our constitution, no? But even so, relig religion had a very important role during these elections, no? Because in on one side, we had the very powerful evangelical fundamentalist churches. And I want to stress that because we are not talking about all evangelical churches. That would be a caricature, <laughs> no? But some churches with lots of power and lots of money. And on the other sides, other religions, no? And it's very interesting to think about it because it's not like this. It doesn't matter if you are talking about a republic. It doesn't matter if the president has a religion or does not have a religion. But it matters a lot in this campaign. So I think religion is a very serious question and topic 
it's a challenge for us republics, mm -hmm. republicans. No, I have nothing against religions, but I think that there is nothing to do with democracy, it's with republic and democracy. No? Um, as we mentioned, Lulu won the election, so I would like uh, to know a little bit about the outlook. Where do you see Brazil heading now that he's been elected? Where do you see the sort of short-term future of the country going? As an historian, it's very difficult <laughs> to say, to, to try, try with this, this story of if it's ha what is going to happen in the future. That's why historians are very conservative. We, we prefer to do it social process that are closed. But I will follow <laughs> your question. Because I think that Brazil was, va was very isolated, internationally speaking. And since Lula was elected, lots of countries uh, came and said that they are going to be present during the ritual of when Lula will be uh, the president of Brazil on January 5th. And so one thing that's very important is not to be isolated. That's going to be very important. I think it's going to have differences in the politics against, about Amazon. Bolsonaro destroyed Amazon 57% more than the former government. I think that Lula will be very strong against Hungary, Hungary because Hungary is back in Brazil. That's brand new. For 10 years, we did not have this problem in Brazil. That's very sad. And I think uh, Lula will be very strong in educational fields. When Lula was president, he created lots of public university all over the country, and that was very important. Mm -hmm and the interior of Bahia, interior of Pernambuco. So I think that that's, he is a person very much connected with social reforms. So I hope this is, will be our future. As I'm going to say in my lecture, uh, I don't think that's the end of the story. <laughs> like, uh, uh, and then Brazilians lived happily together and democratically together forever and ever. It's not like this. But it's the beginning of something. And democracy is like this. It's an open regime. That's the challenge and the beauty of democracy. Because you always have to start it again <laughs> and to fight again. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, elaborate answer. Mm, as a final note, and I, I know you just said it, you prefer as a historian <laughs> to talk about the past, but if you could share with us some strategies how to preserve democracy that might not just be applicable to Brazil, but might um, sort of be applicable to other countries as well with different historical contexts. Yeah. I think that I have some tips how, how we have to, what kinds of things we have to avoid. So avoid patrimonialism better saying mixing public with private spheres. We have to avoid denialism. It's a double <laughs> avoiding, no? Because we need, for a democracy, we need good information. We are in a place of science, so we need good science, good data. We have to avoid to divide society. These new autocracies, they they live better with, if they, they get division. And I think that the art of the politics, since the Greeks, is to create consensus. So we really need to create, cons create consensus. That's not a tip for Brazil. <laughs> That's a, a tip for a world that is divided, that has a lot of hate. So that's not the way we learn how to make democracy be transparent, be solid, and robust. No? So it's very difficult to advise like this. It could look like a little naive. But I think after four years of autocracy, we, we learned something. And it's good to share the things we learned. No? 
And also passing along what not to do, right? Sometimes yeah. that can be just as helpful. Um, with that, we're unfortunately out of time, so it's really my task now to thank you once more. My it's pleasure. really been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for sharing your time and your wise words.